um, we might get underway. Um, delightful for the city, such a crowd, such a crowd of people for our um, international guest today, um, Professor Stephanie Pillai. Um, <coughs> Stephanie is a professor at the University, professor and dean of the Faculty of Languages and Linguistics at um, the University of Malaya. Mm -hmm. in Kuala Lumpur, and um, she's actually has a, had a connection with SOAS for quite a number of years. Um, she was one of the early um, ELDP grantees, and she received a grant to work on the language that she's going to be um, talking about today. Um, and we first met actually I think about five years ago when, um, when Steph came for the ELDP training. At a time when staff who, who, who taught and did research on endangered languages were welcome to be part of the training that's offered at, uh, by the LDP. Um, so Stephanie's uh, expertise in several areas, um, English, the English language, and particularly English as uh, spoken and used in Malaysia, and she will be one of our speakers at Linguistics in the Park in talking about the situation for English in, in Malaysia as part of that. Um, I hope everybody wanders across the house afterwards to participate. And um, perhaps more recently, um, she's been working on um, I hesitate to name the language because <laughs> yes. it's so yeah. very controversial. It is. I'll, I'll talk about that, yeah. I see you're calling it Malacca. Yeah, I'm, I'm being safe. Um, some people call it Kristan with a yeah. C and some call it Kristan with, with a K. K. And Papia Kristan and so on. It's, it's actually quite a hot political potato. Exactly yeah. the name of the languages. <laughs> but it is a, a Portuguese-based creole which has been spoken in Malacca for over 500 years. Um, and came with the Portuguese settlement, uh, probably via India, um, in terms of historical connections. Um, uh, Stephanie is in a unique position to be able to, to do documentary linguistic work with this on this particular language, um, because uh, her mother's <coughs> family are members of the <coughs> Mata Portuguese Creole community. So she's actually working with relatives and friends and people that she knew oh, no longer, my friends. <laughs> growing up with um, in Malacca. So it's a really unique situation of having somebody who's uh, working on the language of their own heritage on, on her mother's side. Um, she's recently completed, um, together with uh, some colleagues, uh, a textbook um, on speaking. You call it Papia Christan here and in brackets. Malacca, so <laughs> Notice the parenthesis. So. Um, the whole thing about the, the spelling of the language name and spelling of the language and so on has been quite a has been quite an issue. Um, should it be spelled like Malay or should it be spelled, should it have accent marks and look funny like Portuguese mm. and so on? Um, has been quite kind of yeah. a hot potato. So the topic of today is actually about the phonology of. Um, Malacca, Portuguese. So hand over to you. OK. Thank you very much, Peter. And um, thank you for having me around. Yeah, you can have a look at it. Um, so some of the things I say might make more sense. Um, I'll just, I'm going to start a little bit about um, Malacca Portuguese Creole, which is what I'm going to call it kind of linguistically. Um, and so that some of you who may not have heard of it or know much about it will get an idea about um, the context of Malacca Portuguese Creole. And then I will talk um, also a little bit about the sounds um, based on the research that I've been doing and some of the areas where we're still finding um, iffy bits because it's a Creole that's, that's that not many, we don't have that many fluent speakers, so it's not very stable with some of the sounds. So we still are... Uh, we found some issues that we still need to deal with. And I also want to talk about the book and how we have tried to um, apply some of the things from the research on sounds into the book in terms of its spelling and deciding um, how to represent the pronunciation of the language. 
Okay, so I'll start um, with Malacca Portuguese Creole. Uh, not many people know that we have a European-based Creole in, Mal in Malaysia. In Malacca in particular, we actually have three Creoles, um, Malacca Portuguese, Baba Malay and Chiti Malay. Um, so kind of uh, representative of the history of Malacca. Yeah? So Malacca um, was a Portuguese colony from 1511 to 1641. And basically, the Portuguese came, set up, set up their fort, if you like, and um, and these are pictures of, of what it may have looked like then. And when when they came, they actually because of the the Portuguese um, policy of actually marrying or having unions with local women. Uh, and as Peter said, basically they would have come from India. They did actually come from Goa um, to conquer Malacca. On the ships would have. Looking at old letters and old old documents, possibly been people of all sorts from along the Portuguese um, settlements in Africa, in in um, India, right? Who came to Malacca? So, a lot of the unions were between um, Portuguese men and local women, but could be Baxter says their band of followers, you know, who were also on the ships with them, right? So. These are my family photos, by the way. Um, so, the, so, so the Portuguese married local women. Let's just keep it simple, but we know that the reality is not that simple. So um, there is now a community of Portuguese Eurasians, right, in Singapore, in Malaysia, um, who, who claim heritage um, from, from 500 or more years ago. And these people then, um, well, the Portuguese that came at that time, the language that came at that time would have been uh, used alongside with whatever the the, lo the local Malay sounded like then, yeah, um, the the patois or the lingua franca of that area was Malay at that time. Um, but there were because Malacca was so cosmopolitan. Some people call it the New York of the 16th century. There were people, Arab traders, Chinese traders, you know, um, Indian traders. There were all sorts of people in Malacca from from the Indonesian islands. So there was a whole range of languages probably spoken um, in Malacca at that time. So the, after a while, with these unions, uh, um, a, a Creole began to develop. Yeah? And it's really interesting because if you go to the graveyard in Malacca, uh, the, the Christian uh, Catholic graveyard, you can see the change, the shift in the language, right? Earlier ones, the ones that are still legible, you can see more, more sort of standard Portuguese of that time in written form. And then it changes to Christang, but still spelt in a more Portuguese way, and then a more local way, and then, then English takes over. Yeah? Um, so you can kind of see the shift, because there were Portuguese schools set up by the, the mission, missionaries at that time in, um, in, in Malacca, while the Portuguese were there. Yeah? Because, of course, when the Dutch came, everything got um, stopped, including um, the language used in the church as well. So um, the descendants... How many of them actually speak the language? Uh, that is the thing. Okay? We, so now, let me just talk a little bit about the language first. The vocabulary is largely derived from Portuguese. So um, I was at a class earlier, right? Um, Shina's class. And you can recognize the words, right? Like, um, so ex example, like, um, you also know me and so know me name. It's, it's, it's kind of familiar. There are things like kumi, which means eat, comer, if you speak Spanish. So... You can see the Latin base in a lot of the words, okay? But more and more, we find English and Malay words coming in <coughs> and replacing what would have been the original Christang word. So, auntie, for the word for aunt used to be tia. Now, most people say ant or auntie, uh, as in English, auntie. Yeah. Um, there are other words as well where Malay Malay terms have come in. Okay. So th this is how it kind of looks like or or sounds like. Um, the grammar and the phonology, we can, we can see considerable influence from Malay, yeah? So the, the grammar is much simpler, so like, my name is Anne, it's just Yosa no mi Anne. So sir is a possessive marker that is used for everything like Yosa Libru or, you know, Yosa Agu. Okay, so it is, it, it is very much simpler and you will also see that, like, Elitafika na Malaka. So for progressive ter or present, we use ter rather than the verb itself doesn't have, um, you know, it doesn't change. We use te, we use logu for future uh, time, we use ja for past, so yo uh, kumi, I have eaten. Okay, so it can be present or it can be um, past as well. 
So that's kind of what it looks like in a very simple way. Right, Peter mentioned this, and I'm glad he did because I was going to talk about it. So what's in a, in a name you would think, you know? Um, okay, if you ask certain people in the, in the Portuguese settlement, um, particularly, these are some of the things you will hear, right? Uh, Christianity, they call, it, they, they call it the Christian religion, right? So um, Christianity, otu fala akeli religion kristang. How can we say that this language we are speaking is Christian? How can we say we are speaking Christian? Right? That is the argument with some of them. Um, I have this interview on the ILA, ILA archive, actually. And, but, but Baxter shows us from documents, earlier documents, that the term Christian was used even, even way back then. And I only ever remember my grandmother referring to the language as Christian not even as Portuguese. And most of my informants, I would say nine, 8 out of 10 of my, my, my respondents or the community members, if you ask them, what do you speak? They would say Kristang. If you ask them what they are, they would also say, oh, I'm, I'm Kristang. Or if they meet each other, and they say, oh, Kristang, boss Kristang. Okay, rather than boss Portuguese. Okay, or boss Creole. Okay. Um, so... Is it a three-in-one term then? Um, I think Hancock says, or Baxter, and Baxter also say that Kristang is really a three-in-one that covers religion, ethnicity, and language. Yeah. So this is like typical of what we will get in interviews. We Kristang, we have to talk Kristang in in our in at home, so we must teach the children also. So we Kristang, I am Kristang, and I speak. Kristang. This is very common. In fact, the first one, which is the original meaning of, uh, of where it would have come from Portuguese, is hardly ever used. No one will ever say, I am Kristang to mean I'm Christian. Because generally, most of them are Catholic and they would say, I'm Catholic or I'm whatever I am right now. So the word Kristang is actually the original meaning is hardly used for religion. And this is normal with language, right? It changes its meaning and so on. But there are people in, in the community that want to for whatever reason, uh, are making a strong case for the fact that we cannot use the word Kristang. But in most, uh, 9 out of 10 cases, people use Kristang to mean the language. Yeah? So hence, you will see Papia Kristang as in speak Kristang. Yeah? And it doesn't really mean, it doesn't mean Christian anymore. Okay. So the Padre Suchang, where I do my, my work, um, is also known as the Portuguese settlement or Kampung Portugis in Malacca. And here comes another name for it, right? That in Malaysia, generally, Eurasians, are, uh, Eurasians of all, whether you're Portuguese Eurasian or Dutch Eurasian or whatever Eurasian or Pan Asian, right? Um, are referred to as Eurasian in English. But in Malay, the term Serani is referred, uh, you generally started, it was actually used to refer to people of Portuguese Eurasian descent. Nasrani meaning Christian, again, all right? Um, so there are all these terms floating about. There are, there are groups who say, let's just call us Serrani. And the people of Portuguese Eurasian descent say, no, we are Portuguese Eurasian. Serrani is too, you know, it's everyone and everyone. So we don't want to be called that. So there are issues as, as, a, as a person describing the language, what word, which one to use. So. Portuguese, uh, Malacca Portuguese seems is safe, is ex more accepted. Um, you won't have the controversies <coughs> of using Kristang, only Kristang, which is why in our book we have it in parentheses. Um, otherwise, we would have a riot. So this settlement was um, set up in the 1930s to house Eurasians or Portuguese Eurasians who were living all over Malacca, right? Uh, and the, the area still exists now. Of course, it's become a bit smaller because they're some of the land uh, has been taken over for different purposes. So right now, right, we look at today, if we look at the latest census, it says that there are about 2,300 others. Okay. In Malaysia, we are all categorized by race, right? So you're either Indian, Chinese, Malay, uh, Bumiputra, which are like, covers the indigenous community and the Malays, or others. And some East Malaysian groups are, are now, now have their own term, uh, own ethnic groups that they can, they can choose. So Eurasians and Portuguese Eurasians come under others, right? So you can now start to understand why the term actually has some controversy because it is about labeling yourself when state, state define, the state defines you as 
others, you know, you're in not, not any important category. Now, only about, so among the 2,300 in Malacca, this would include other um, Eurasians, yeah, not just the Portuguese Eurasians. So it's not a very big number in Malacca. And Malacca is the largest concentration next to Penang, probably. Uh, and about 1,000 live in, the, actually it's less, about 800 probably live in the settlement itself. 1,000 if you, if you count the surrounding areas, the, the flats, the apartments um, close by the settlement. Okay. So what's happening in the settlement right now is that generally you can hear it. And um, although some people say, oh, no one speaks it anymore in the settlement, that is not true. You still hear it hear people shouting from one end of, you know, like three houses across uh, in Kristang. You still hear it if you sit, if you go under the trees while the fishermen are waiting after their, their boats have come in. You can still hear it. But generally, they are older speakers, right? And if you might find them to be about 45, 46 and above, even then, only if they have lived in the settlement for a long period of time or in Malacca and they have lived with older, you know, older speakers like grandparents and parents and so on. Most of the younger speakers, um, definitely the teenagers, they use more English and their variety of English. Yeah, uh, mixed. And there's a lot of code, code switching going on, code mixing going on with Chris Tang. And you have to understand that Malaysia being Malaysia, in the settlement itself, you would... I put English in the big, the, as the biggest um, you know, blurb there because English is the majority language that you will hear there. Okay, albeit it's their own variety of English, right? And then you will hear Kristang as well, a Malacca Portuguese Creole. Malay is definitely there. It's our national language. It is the medium of instruction of public schools. So everyone in the settlement would be able to speak Malay. Generally in the settlement, most people are bilingual, if not trilingual, with Kristang, right? English, Malay, English, Kristang, Malay. Some very old speakers, like in, may only know Kristang, very old speakers who generally are no longer around. And there are others as well, because there are, there's a lot of mixed marriages in, among Portuguese Eurasians, right? Married, Chinese, Indians. So they would also pick up some of those languages um, as well. So you will hear a whole gamut of languages. So the situation is a multilingual situation, which may be different from some of the research sites that some of you may be working on, where you solely have that, only that minority language or indigenous language, yeah? So it is considered endangered because of the number of fluent speakers Outside the settlement, generally, you people don't speak it anymore. My, my mother's family, none of her siblings actually speak it. They're now learning it from the book, okay? Um, they heard their mother and father, but generally more their mother speaking it, but they, would, they didn't grow up speaking English. During the British, uh, when British colonization, most people who were educated, or who wanted their children to be educated would insist on using English. And this wasn't just the Portuguese Eurasians, also a lot of Indian families um, grew up speaking English. Okay? Right. Um, let, me, let me move on to the sounds of um, like a Portuguese Creole. So I do my, my research in the settlement itself mainly, and we record speakers. Um, we try to look for fluent speakers. Not easy um, to find them. Uh, generally, the women. A lot of the men have worked outside and have a lot of influence from, from other languages, whereas the women, many of them are stay-home moms or have not had much um, contact outside. So they still tend to use a lot of um, Kristang, yeah? And basically, I just want to go through some of the consonants. You can, if you, if you know Malay or if you look at Malay, you can see a lot of similarities with Malay in terms of the way the consonants work. Um, sorry, I was, I was editing this and then I, I couldn't use my laptop, so um, just ig ig ignore the mistakes like pi and, and uh, by there. Okay, it should have been changed. Uh, basically, the pi and by, um, I, I, will, I will go through some of them, not, not all of them. We have an issue with the glottal stops, so... Um, we actually didn't include it in the first in the first instance because we th we thought that it was just glottalization happening and possibly maybe it was an allophonic variation because it usually only happens uh, not usually but it always happens at the end of a word um, spelt in some books with a k so like a book in some books is spelt with a k like Malay it is not 
pronounced as a K in Malaysian Malay. Okay, in, in Malaysian Malay, we would never say, uh, for example, deaf is peka, spell P E K A K. We would never say pekak. We would just say peka, and there is a, a, a glottal stop at the end, right? So, and we found that this was happening with Kristang. But when we wrote, uh, we we were, we wrote a paper for. The Journal of uh, IPA, and they said that oh, you know, you should make, you should include this as one of your consonants. Okay, so I haven't signed up the revisions because we're still looking into this. I don't think it's a separate um, phoneme in the language. So, okay, um, the the fur, the fur and ver, you find that the ver doesn't occur very much in the beginning of words. Um, but maybe because of the, and, and, and this is like Malay, right? But because of the influence of English, you hear it a bit more. Uh, and so words like vinagre, which is vinegar, also pronounced as vinagre. So people who speak more English tend to use vina, vinagre. And the more, the older speakers, you will hear them saying vinagre. So, and that also happens sometimes with the, um, the f and the p as well. Yeah? Okay, so we don't like Malay, the initial pataka, we don't find it aspirated and when it is, people get very influenced with English, so that's why we have to be really careful as to who our informants are. Uh, those who are fluent in Eng who have become very fluent in English, who work outside the settlement, very high, uh, if they are highly educated or they are more educated, you will find more aspiration in their pataka because they probably are... Uh, uh, using the English pataka, but in the settlement, like uh, for the for the for those who are fluent in Kristang and use more Kristang than English, you will not find them. And so when we measure aspiration uh, acoustically, you don't find the uh, VOT yeah, being very very uh, big. So this is very similar to Malay, and this is kind of expected. So we're still we're still doing work on this, um, and as I said, the final curve actually is very rare. Um, this is something that, because the paper I, I was working on is with, with Baxter, and um, I'm not convinced that even Balsak, there is a k in there. It, it is actually glottalized, um, yeah, because we're unlikely, like Malay, we're unlikely to pronounce the, the ending, the end as a k, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, so um, among all the, the fricatives that we, we find sir at the end, but we usually don't find z very, very, we do, but very rare. And as I said, the b and the v are used interchangeably. Yeah? Same with bino and vino yeah? for wine as well. Okay, um, this is what, where it's different from Malay. Yeah? And basically, where you can actually have things like the m. The nasal followed by a consonant, uh, b, mbezu, mpoku, nda. Although some speakers have a vowel in front, right? So, and this method when we were doing our book, whether to add the, the vowel or not, or just have the nasal. So whether you say m, or it's just a m, it's difficult to, because different speakers will have a different way of saying it. So maybe they are just in, in free variation, perhaps. I mean, that you have two alternative pronunciation. Um, so you, you do not have this in, in Malay. Yeah? In terms of the sound, oh, it's not here, but in terms of the, the nasals, um, we share similar, the similar inventory with Malay as well. We have the nya, as in nyapu, uh, which, which we don't have in English, right? The nya, right? we only have the mm. So there are some similarities, but you can see that it is not exactly like Malay as perhaps represented by some, some um, authors, yeah? This is another one that's different from at least Peninsular Malay. We have the tap, trill, r. So you have notri or notri with a r rather than notri. English notary, so we in almost all cases the r is uh, is actually uh, produced as either a tap or a, a trill, and we find that it is a trill more when when it is a con in consonant cluster, like say um, when you have the r and either before or 
uh, we, for example, like in notary, notary, notary. I, it's difficult for me to say it because I, I, I'm more of an English speaker, right? I don't have that trill. And in Peninsular Malaysia, generally in Malay as well, we don't have the trill. So we don't say mereka, we say mereka. You go to East Malaysia, you might hear mereka. Go to Indonesia, you will hear mereka, right? So the trill is not a common thing, uh, but you can hear it in the settlement. But when they speak Malay, there's no trill. Right when they speak Malay, so so that's again that that's that's it, it's not the case that Malay and Kristang are exactly the same, in and and people are able to shift from from one to another. Still, some work to be done here as well. Um, okay, the vowels now. This is where we got into so much trouble <laughs> uh, because we, if you look at previous work and even what Baxter had said or Hancock, um, the, it wasn't clear about these vowels. Yeah. The A, A, and the O, and the O, right? Because um, when we started to record, two things happened. One is we realized that there were these four sounds. Although previous work had said that they were there, they didn't really explain what was going on. You know, they are, maybe they are elephones, or they only contrast in one or two words. Uh, but that's not true, because we found many other instances. So we are actually working on these four sounds. And it's a nightmare, because we realized, again, are they in free variation? Are people just shifting, you know, are using one or the other? It seems to be the case in some words, but in other words, it's like very clearly, no, 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 you cannot say, for example, uh, you cannot say bebe, you have to say, you have to say the, eh, the A sound, right? Be, bebe, not bebe. But in other words, it's like you ask what person A, they will say, um, you know, a boss is another one which is, which is not changeable. So, some words just happen to be interchangeable, and now we're trying to figure out Okay, what's going on here? Which ones are, you know, is it because of the etymology? Is it because of the word class? And what, what is going on? So we haven't quite sorted that out. Then we, similarly to the A and the A, you have the O and the O. So boss, when a lot of English speakers try to speak, Kristang go boss, which is you, right? But then, then they, you will get told up and say it's boss, right? Is it bong or bong, pamyang? So which one is it? Um, because... You know, in, in English, generally, we don't, at least, at least the English that we speak in Malaysia, the, the O that we use is usually to replace the diphthong like uh, O, right? So we don't have boat, we have boat. But, we don't, but for the monothong, it's still a, sh it's a shorter O. We don't really have a distinction between the long and the short or the, the two O's. Um, so it will be like bot and... I don't know, like pot and pot will sound the same, P-O-T, P-O-R-T, no difference, right? But in Kristang, there is a distinction between using O and O. But again, the problem is that some words, different speakers, and the same speaker sometimes could use O in the first instance and O in the other instance. Okay, so these are the problems that we face or the challenges that we face um, with <laughs> languages that are not being used as much as they should. Then you, you seem to be having sort of individual styles and, you know, not like a standard, standard usage, yeah? Okay, so um, this is work in progress, so, you know, uh, it looks weird, the chart. This is just based on the formal measurements that we've had, um, and we're just using it to, to track and see where are the potential problem areas. When we do the scatter plot, it's even, more, it's even worse, right? Because especially between... These two, they look so clearly defined, but with some words, there's a clear merger between these two um, and, and these ones as well. It's like possibly with some words, people just alternating between the, the two. So those are some of the areas that we really need to, to look at. Um, the other thing that may be affecting the quality of the vowels um, is the stress. Now, this is again where Kristang is different from Malay and even different from English, Malaysian English, because it has stress. It has lexical stress. Okay? Um, although, again, we find that it can shift. Sometimes it's not as um, stable as we think it is, but there is stress, right? If you, you can hear it. Um, and Generally, things like um, verbs, you, you find that the stress shifts to the to word final. So, like fika, yeah, aprende, okay. Um, but for the other words, it's usually penultimate. But then again, um, 
we need to we need to look into more into this because like Malaysian English, one of the issues that we and Singapore English has, we do have phrase final lengthening, right? So if you take w a word level uh, kind of um, data elicitation, you will find that all the time your stress is going to go towards the end, but that may not be what is actually happening because you know if each one becomes one international phrase, then yeah, obviously the stress is going to be at the end of the phrase, whether you have it in a sentence or a word. So you need to be careful of your elicitation methods as well. So we're looking at um, more informal conversations to see what's happening with the stress. Uh, because the patterns are quite different from Malaysian English, right? Malaysian English, there is, there really is no stress pattern. It's, it's, it's syllable timed, and even for focus or marking new information or important information, there is no clear um, stress on on the syllable. So it's very hard to hear if you don't know the context. What, which, if you listen to our news, if you track the pitch on our news, for example, said in English, you will find that it doesn't have so much of the da 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 da. It's very much more flatter, yeah. But in in Kristan, and if you go to the settlement, and even if you hear them speaking English, there is a different intonation pattern going on, and that's something that we are also working on at the moment which I, I haven't shared because we, we are still in the process of analyzing the data. Okay, so um, let, me, let me talk about the applications. Yeah? It's well and good to do the research and, and do the papers. Um, but now, how did we apply it into the book? Okay, this was where the nightmare started. Because when we, when we disc an, an interesting thing as well, because then we had a team to work on with the... With the with the community, let's see if I've got it here. Yeah. So of course we have our recordings, right? And Peter's talked about this a lot, and and you know now on on hindsight, okay, I wish I had foresight because you start off doing your research not thinking that you are going to do something more impactful with it, right? You do your documentation and think that's it. I'm just going to put it up. That's the end of it. So because of that, you don't plan for how you're going to use or what materials you need for your documentation. Um, which means that when you come to the documentation, you think, ah, now I need to record some more, and I, or I need to come up with new things, which, you know, if you have all the time in the world, is good, but... So this is um, where we had to record some new things. Sorry. Um, but we also use, you know, things that we had recorded, things that we had analyzed, like the sound system, for example, because we knew what were, were some of the issues that were coming up from the analysis. We could discuss it with the speakers and ask them, and then they would debate about, no, but I say A, and another person would say, no, I say A. So we went around saying, okay, you go ask five people, older speakers, and you go ask five older speakers or whatever, or WhatsApp us the, the recordings, or you WhatsApp, send us by WhatsApp the, the recordings. So that helped, because like, we are in KL, and they are in Malacca. We, we couldn't always go there. Then we had some workshops to debate about this. Okay, And because the pronunciation and the spelling are related, we had huge fights, no fights, not literal fights, but debates, yeah, about how to, sp what do we do with the spelling system? So, for example, if you've got, um, you can have a, 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 you can have a, a, a. So, how do we represent this in the spelling? In Malay, for example, now we don't use any accent marks, right? We just use e. So, you can have perang, perang, it's spelled the same way. Now, what happens now in Kristang when you have a, a, and uh, okay, so part of the, the, the choice was how about if we, they, the, the, the people we worked with um, felt that we shouldn't follow Malay spelling, which, which is phonemic basically, um, um, 100%. Most of the other writers before us have followed a Malay spelling because it is easier to read, right? If you see B-A-K-A, -A, it is Baka. Okay, although in Krishna it can be baka, okay? Which in Peninsular Malaysia as well, we would say baka, the, the A ending is usually a schwa. Okay, so what do we do? Now, the, now, because there was a feeling that if we just had a spelling system that just looked like Malay, where was the identity of the language? Where was the Kristang in it? Where was the portuguese in it, right? So they were like, can't we follow Portuguese spelling? And thankfully... I had a, a Portuguese teacher on my team 
Okay, um, and, and Angela would tell them, no, Portuguese spelling is horrendous. It is, you know, even for me as a native speaker, I still, you know, um, have to think about it sometimes. So we do not want to go that way. So we now had to like, okay, we can't do... In what, what, kind of, what kind of spelling system were, were Malaysian speakers okay, likely to be, to be um, used to, right? So my third point there, most Malaysians would be familiar with English and Malay, right? Having learned it in school. But we know that Malay spelling in a way is because it's more phonemic, it's easier to represent sounds, okay? But there was an issue of identity. Having, you know, you, you don't want to be the same as someone else, you still wanted to reflect the Portugueseness. So how did we do it? Not everyone's going to agree with it. And at the end of the day, I know that practically, right, in terms of the context of use and ease of use, people are not going to use the accent markers. Because okay? even among our WhatsApp group of the team that did the book when we typed, we have to make a conscious effort. Firstly, we have to tell them, show people how to use the accent marks because we don't use that in English or Malay. Right? But we put that in so that it is like surface level, it looks like this, but we know that alternatively people are going to spell it without the accent markers. Right? So if you, look, if you had a look at the book, you will see the, the spelling system. Right? Um, so the spelling system generally, one was the issue with the sounds, having to deal with is this an O, is this an O, is it an E, is it an E, uh, uh, is it an A, right? So one was that. Okay. The other one was to deal with okay, how to represent these in the spelling system. I'll give you a simple, another example, right? With the cons with, with ch, for example, ch, like like uh, cheru, for example. In Malay, we have done away with ch, right? We use c now. So when you see c in Malay, you pronounce it as ch. So uh, chawan cup is spelled c a w a n. In old and I say old, uh, in, in old Malay, not even old actually, uh, it used to be spelled C-H-A-W-A-N, Chawan. So you, you knew it was C-H. So one of the decisions we made was to keep the C-H so that people knew when they saw C-H it was Ch, right? Um, but when it came to the K sound, uh, there was a bit of a, a debate because Generally, if you look at Baxter, if you look at uh, Joe Marbach's work, it's all spelled with a K, K, which is actually very much easier to, to read. But again, the question of identity, of reflecting something that didn't look exactly like Malay, so we came to a compromise. So I'm not completely happy with it, but um, you will see that that's, hence Kristang became CR rather than uh, KR. Okay? But that's not a big issue because you can see the, the K is easy to read. The problem is when you have C, I know that some people are going to read it as ch, right? So kumi, do you spell it K-U-M-I, which would be so easy and so, uh, so easy to see, but then you, we have an alternative C-U-M-I, which could be read as chumi, right? So there's some, some compromises that we had to make, yeah? Um, so these are some of the things that we had to think about in terms of the spelling, the, the sound systems that we knew. Then the stress was another thing, you know, where to place stress. Again, for, for, for many words, people were stressing differently. And then we realized it really was contextual as well. So we had to decide on where to put the stress, like in a general sense. And, but what would happen in actual conversation might be completely different, yeah? Okay. We also were thinking in terms of the spelling really for this, right? the teaching and learning. Because this book is being used to teach children and teach adults. And many people are buying the book to try and learn Kristang. So these were some of the considerations we had um, to take into account. Okay. Right. I'll just show you very, very, this is from, from the book. And you can see, you know, there are some things here you think, why did you do that? You know, uh, but... So, so this, is some, this is some of the spelling systems that we use. So you have the regular A at the end of the words. And basically, if you have a regular A at the end of a word, it is actually a, a schwa. So you have like dia, which is day, right? Nunca, which is no. And then you have chuma, which is like, right? Chuma, like. So if you, if you see the accents at A, then you have the um, A vowel at the end, okay? So 
Brinka, Ola, Papia. Generally, verbs in particular will have that A ah at the end. So, a little bit complicated, a little bit new for Malaysians who are not used to having these accents, right? But it makes it look different. Okay, it makes it look European, I guess. Okay? Um, then we have the regular E, which has two sound representations, right? So, you have like the E, uh, the schwa, and it also has the E sound there. So this one is a little bit difficult because they wanted, uh, you know, we discussed and we, we thought about you want to put this accent and that accent and we said no because it's just not going to work, right? It's too complicated. But we have at the end of our book uh, a pronunciation guide for all the words that appear in our book. So we thought that would help them a little bit. Um, then we have the accented um, E, right? So, which is used for like the S sound, okay, krensa, festa, mestri. Um, okay, with the O, there was no option. We were not going to use any uh, another accent. So, we just left the O and O as the letter O, right? Um, and this is a bit complicated with, as I said, for English speakers, uh, even Malaysian English speakers who are more used to when they see an O having an O sound, bong, body, yo, which is not, it's yo, it's body and it's bong. So we have put it at the back of our book, how you pronounce these words, okay? And the, the most problematic one for me is this, the, the letter C, okay? But these, all these decisions were made after a whole big round of debate and discussions, yeah? So here come the linguists and the language you know, teachers and say, no, 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 you should do this. But then when we discuss it with the community and take into account all the factors um, that I talked about, then we have to come to some form of compromise here. Yeah? Okay, um, yeah, so we've got the letter K, we've got CH, which we decided to keep. The J is still with like Jading, Genti, Judah. Okay, and one other thing that we, we compromised on and we kept was whether to, or decided, we had to decide on whether to use KUA or QUA, and, and we decided on QUA after. Several other rounds of debate, okay? Okay, so I'm going to leave more room for questions and answers, Ria, or for you. So, muito grande merci, which is thank you very much to you in, in Kristang. So, let's have, um, I'm happy to answer your questions, yeah, if you have any. I hope you have. Okay. Okay. That was very quick. <laughs> yeah, sorry. In terms of um, revitalization, yeah. um, what's the relationship between Portuguese and um, Malay? Because those are the two contact yeah. languages, right? Yeah. So, for example, when, when there's a vocabulary missing, or yeah. structures missing, yeah. maybe because it's endangered, yeah. um, where do they draw mm -hmm. on that from? And do you apply some of the other sound changes? Yeah. Um, from Portuguese to Portuguese words. Oh, okay. Um, in terms of vocabulary, it depends on when the word comes came in, right? So you'll find that at the time, uh, if it was like say maybe 20 years ago, you may find more English words coming in. But even now, it depends also on the context. So perhaps if it is to do with food, right, uh, ingredients, you find more local stuff, you find more Malay words, right? If you, if you look at the ILA, uh, my recording of someone teaching you how to make acha pesi, fish acha, a lot of Malay words in there. Then she'll also have a word like blend for, for, you know, to blend. But then the ingredients, a lot of it, she will say jintan manis, jintan puteh, so she uses Malay, right? So it depends on the context and depends kind of when the word comes in as well. Um, in terms of the sound changes, it's, it's, it's really funny because a lot of the sound changes, again, depends on the speaker rather than... That's what we're finding now, and that's why the, the, there's variety. People who went to school studying um, with English as a medium of instruction apply more um, English, English rules, in a sense. Yeah. You mean from Portuguese? From Portuguese. So, so for example, um, when, you want, when you want to make materials that yeah. um, revitalize yeah, the yeah, language, yeah. Um, there are changes between um, this Creole and Portuguese, oh, yeah. obviously. Definitely. Um, and then there's the influence from Malay and English. Yeah. So I get you. Yeah. When you want to make a yeah. word, which was a Christian word yeah. that is missing in Christian okay. English, what um, do you do? Good, good question. Yeah. We try not to, in, in at least in, in my group, uh, we try not to make up words, right? 
But I know the Singaporeans are doing that, right? They have gone another way and they actually have a, uh, what do they call it, like a lab um, where they, they are going to try and create and test new words out, yeah? Our, our, our side, maybe we're more conservative because I work with some older speakers. They actually went out to look for what was the word in Kristang. You know, they asked older speakers, uh, what, do, what do we call this? You know, in, and we tried to bring it back. Even though now there may have been a English borrowing or a Malay borrowing, um, they tried to bring this word back. Even some of the words which were contracted, they said this was actually the original um, word, yeah. So they, so that's what we did for ours. So we didn't actually make up, but I suspect that some of the words that they didn't realize was made up actually had come from Portuguese or were actually English English words. So we we don't have a record of when exactly every word came in. Yeah. So like for example, you have celebre sang. So did it come from English or was it originally in Kristang already? Already, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 It, again, a lot of the words may have been something else and over time changed, but then remember we had no Spanish contact. That's why yeah, I yeah. Because our the only I mean we have like a Spanish Creole, but that comes from the Philippines and that's in, in East Malaysia. But our contact is, is very much Portuguese. And if you if you look at texts from Sri Lankan Portuguese, a lot of the words are very similar. They they seem to be the same. So so perhaps what came to Malacca already was a, a, a creole, you know, a form of creole, what, whatever was developing that was being spoken by people on the ship that came from Africa, that came from India. Uh, you look at Sri Lankan texts, you look at some Indian texts, and, and, and after that, in, from Malacca, people went to Indonesia, went to Macau, so there are all these similarities. So yeah, so, so the whole myth about this being... Um, Portuguese antigo or old Portuguese is really not true but some some people hang on to this and say you know we speak in ancient Portuguese and this is the original Portuguese but it's clearly not so yeah it is something that has beautifully developed and and you know sort of metamorphosized into into this this language that we have today yeah so that's why yeah you have to look but People from Brazil, my Brazilian colleague was working with me on the book, said a lot of the words she had, it's familiar to her because in rural Brazil, some of the words are still used, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, going back to the M. Yeah, that and uh, yeah. Yes, I was wondering if the M that we saw, we saw a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, do you think that it could come from having reanalyzed the definite article yeah. along? Yeah. Because in, for example, in Asian yeah. Creole, yeah. the la of la. French yeah. is part of the noun. Yes. Now established la table. That's right. Yeah. So yes. is it? Is it? It is possible. Yeah. And as and and that's why the some of the older speakers feel that we should. Some some speakers feel um, when you write it, you should separate it. Like you put yeah. mm, poku yeah. with a, and if you look in the book as well, we spelt it with a u or an e, depending on the whether it's um or um, because they felt it needed to be like like a separate um, um, item, I guess, right? Yeah. So it's possible, yeah. It, it it may have started and like in most creoles, right? You have this merger of words. Yes. Yeah. 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 Why did you in in those M words? I was yeah. wondering. Sometimes, like I, I noticed that in Mbezu, yeah. you have M apostrophe. Yeah, there, yeah. But in Impoku, you have M per without the apostrophe. Okay, probably I forgot. But that is actually the the stress mark. As I said, I was editing it on my laptop. It was I just think. a stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a stress, right? So you yeah. did put the stress between the M yeah, and yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The stress will not be on the first. You don't say like Impoku. It will be like Impoku. So the stress will always be on the on the consonant following the m, mm or or if there is a vowel following the uh, before the mm preceding the m, mm, you still stress the the consonant after the nasal. 
never before. So, yeah. And when you don't put an apostrophe, like... Uh, yeah, it wasn't meant to be an apostrophe, that I have to apologize. Okay, okay, yeah, okay yeah, it's fine. meant to be a stress, yeah. To well, well noted, though, okay. yeah. Yes, sorry, yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit about this sort of weighing up between um, an orthography that reflects the Portuguese, yeah. however... Yeah, it imagined it is, yeah. Yeah, imagined it is, yeah. and uh, the ease of use, so yeah. it's kind of yeah. difficult thing between it is, yeah. identification mm. and ease of use. Um, when talking with uh, speakers, yeah. what did you find was the most, like, the most salient, most important thing for them when using the orthography? And um, the teacher in our group, right, if you, if you look well, the, the book was produced together with... Um, with um, representatives of the Malacca Portuguese Eurasian Association. The teacher among them wanted a, a simpler way that young children especially would be able to follow and accents probably were not a good idea. But, but the others in the group and, and when we, we talk, started talking about identity issues and, and then it seemed that at least on, at the surface level something that looked different from the other languages in Malaysia seem to be more important. So identity is, is definitely a big thing. Uh, and you need to understand the whole social structure, the whole political structure now in Malaysia to understand why people feel it, it's so important to identify yourself. Yeah? Among the Eurasians as well, I have to say, there's a bigger group, uh, not bigger group, but the group outside Malacca who feel that the Portuguese Eurasians should just combine and make a big Sarani in fact, Joan Marbeck, her, her recent books, called it the Sarani language. And that did not go down well, you know, with the community. How can you change it to Sarani? Sarani means everybody who's Eurasian. And so you're like, they're saying that we are like, what? I don't know, 2% of the population. And here you want to forge a, a smaller group within a smaller you know, minority within a minority. But why are people doing it? You know, why do they want to identify with um, being Portuguese Eurasian. In fact, the word Kristang, despite the fact that if you go on Facebook, you can see the, the big wars going on, even against the Singaporeans, because they call it Kristang as well. If you look at the youth in the community, right, you can see that identity is very important. They are selling T-shirts. I'm Kristang. I know my Kristang is, you know, uh, I know who, where I come from. That kind of... Um, I think it's very telling, you know, if you're into looking at... It, at uh, representation of these kind of things. And the youth are coming up with it. So even if they don't really speak Kristang very fluently, but they're trying to forge their identity of being Kristang through this kind of, you know, wearing this T-shirt very proudly uh, that says Kristang in my DNA. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And what other ways are they expressing their identity wearing the T-shirt? <laughs> okay, they are much more involved in like the festivals, the organization of festivals. Um, previously, you'd see like it's the village committee that comes up. You know, we have festivals like Water Day preceding Lent, and then there's the festival of San Pedro, San Juan, big festivals which draw thousands of you know tourists. Christmas, Christmas as well. Now we see the youth taking part a lot more. Uh, some people are unhappy about that because of course they they also have all the modern things in there, right? The DJs and the foam parties, but. They are, uh, and, and I think, they, and it's a real homecoming. We have this term balik kampung in Malaysia, which is coming, going back to your village. And literally, you can see that during festivals. People from Singapore, from KL, they just come. It's like, this is where we can, you know, we can feel that we are Kristang, right? You, you can hear people speaking, you can practice your Kristang, you get to eat all the lovely food, meet your relatives. And, ce and celebrate, and there's a lot of street party. There's a lot of that Latin culture of street party still there. So that's that's where they they really um, show their their identity as being different from an Indian, a Chinese, or a Malay. Yeah. Even if they are actually half Chinese, half Malay, right? Or like me, half <coughs> half Indian. Yeah. Any young yeah. singers? Sorry. Any young singers? Singers? Um, young singers. Yeah, not not in the settlement. They they are they are they perform at within the within the community, but not so much out there. Um, older singers, yeah, older singers, yeah. yeah. The thing is about the Christian community; they don't sing so much Christian songs. They're very big on country music. <laughs> they love country music. Yeah.
It was just yeah. Maybe you could mention Kevin because most oh yeah yeah of course Kevin um, in Singapore you know he he records um, cover versions of like Coldplay and so on uh, in Kristan which is really nice and in this the is in, a, yeah a young chap who's yeah. Twenty mm. something. Very yeah, early twenties. Uh, yeah, hasn't even graduated, I think. Yeah, yeah. but amazing guy. So he's been studying at National University of Singapore, mm. doing linguistics. Um, is it his grandfather? I think the connection is not through his. His mum. His mum. His mum is Eurasian. Yeah. And so he's become this. I mean. Champion. <laughs> Champion. Yeah, he's a champion. Yeah. He's a real activist. He is. Yeah. And they've been. He's. Yeah. Um, they have a tiny community. I think about a hundred yeah, speakers. Yeah, probably he's less fluent speakers. But he's gone all out, and he's you, he's got YouTube videos. Yeah. As, she, as um, Steph said, singing cover versions <laughs> of Coldplay, and um, and they've been the ones just to to answer Martin's question. Yeah. They, yeah. they have this whole kind of. Um, incubator. incubator, incubator. Yeah. Now I, I thought of the word now. Um, yeah. And so they've been, you know, they have all these, they have these meetings yeah. to to figure out, you know, new vocabulary yeah. for, you know, mouse and laptop. And yeah. Which which has been criticised by some Malaccans. Do they feel? Yeah. It's a sort of ironical really. situation in terms of revitalisation yeah. because the core community is the group that Stephanie is describing with yeah. maybe a thousand speakers. And a hundred people were moved to Singapore. Well, a smaller group moved to Singapore. How long did you know? That was during the British period. British period, wasn't it? yeah. The Japanese also moved, moved them. And the Japanese moved them there. Mm. But that group has now sort of shrunk to mm. about a hundred people. Mm. But that's the most active seat for all, yeah. for all this stuff that's going yeah. on. Yet they're not the genuine. <laughs> yeah. So. There's this kind yeah. of political tension yeah, yeah, yeah. that's and, and, uh, going on, yeah. and yet there's this young guy who's just been so active. Yeah. At, at Doing great work, I think. Yeah. yeah. What I thought about that was that if you were to compare it with Portuguese, so let's say standard Portuguese, yeah. um, well, I actually noticed some Gallego mm. similarities. Yes. Um, for example, um, the word one, mm. I think is um. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. in um, in Portuguese, um, um, not um, yeah. uh, not in Portuguese, in Galicia. Yeah. So maybe there are these kind of changes if yeah. you want to compare it. Yeah. So when they're trying to make new words, yeah. do maybe they apply these changes somehow? Yeah. Um, and do they would they draw on that rather than yeah. Malay words or English words? Because the contact with, with like say even Portuguese, right? It's not there. We we've got I mean Portu Portugal the Institute Portugal Portuguese Language Institute sends people to the settlement uh, now and then to teach standard Portuguese and that sometimes is in conflict with the Creole because some of them will come say things like this is a bastardized version that you're speaking, it is a bad version. You you know, I've had arguments with one of the guys that came because he said Oh, you know, they should learn to speak. They are being taught the wrong, wrong pronunciation. And I'm like, what wrong, you know, what pronunciation are you talking about here? So there's that tension of these, you know, um, these Portuguese people who come. The thing is, the reality is, there's no real contact, right? Some people who have been to Portugal, you know, on scholarships or whatever, come back and then they might have a more Portuguese pronunciation. Then the others will say, we never say that. That's not how my grandmother say that. So, so that's, the, the contact is really Malay. Malay and Malaysian English, right? When I say English, I wouldn't even say, you know, what's our contact with English? It's, it is our local variety. So that is the, if any sound changes are going to be applied, it's going to come from there. Right? And all, or they make it their own. So like aunt, like I said, instead of aunt, it's auntie. Auntie, auntie yeah. Auntie, instead of tia, which is, which is what they would have used, you know? Yeah. How would you say grandfather or grandmother? Um, okay, Ab so abo, abo Femi is a grandmother. So I, if you, uh, abo is just grandparents, right? Yeah. But they don't, I mean, they would call their, their, I called my grandfather Dada and my grandmother Nanny. And that's Nan or Nanny is the usual term, right? So you use English, English terms most of the time. But for brother and so on, they tend to use more look Christian words like Baba, Nona, yeah, rather than, because there's no English word for big sister, big 
big brother. You see, whereas in Malay and most Asian languages, you have because you have to maintain um, hierarchy, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is the, the other language that you said um, is being taught in the school? Um, Malay? Sorry, Malay and English? No, I mean, um, you said there's a. Oh, oh um, hang on. Is it Samai? I think it's Samai, Samai. but I may be wrong. Yeah. It's it's the it's one of the oral Muslim languages. Of course, in, in East Malaysia, you have uh, Kanazan, you have Iban, right? So Iban, those are big languages. But in West Malaysia, with the indigenous languages, it's been a bit slow. Yeah. yeah. I don't do documentation, so it is a naive question. <laughs> no, but I always wonder. You know, you were talking about the alphabet, and then you had discussions, and you know how yeah, yeah, French yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, so the first thing that would come to the mind of a linguist is that why don't they just go for the IPA, and things will be sort of read the way the words are pronounced. But in the conversation, you said we wanted to keep the identity. Yeah, yeah. Is it the only reason why one would not adopt if you start from scratch a writing system? Yeah, yeah. Is it why you didn't choose the IPA? Um, you can't really use, I mean, the IPA I think is for linguists, right? So for linguists, it's no problem because we can use the IPA to represent and we know how it sounds like. And so in the book as well, we have actually used um, basic IPA to represent, to, to kind of give people how the pronunciation is based on our work. But in terms of a spelling system, you still have to use uh, a Romanized alphabet system. But why? Yeah. I'm just um, wondering why. Have, if having taught students the IPA, uh, you know, it is not an easy system to, to learn, right? So, so without the, the, the sort of, you know, really, to, you know, like finding tuning of the IPA, just, you know, roughly speaking, if you it's very really easy. Not really, because if you learn, just take the A, R, the, the A, A, and A vowel, okay, then you'll have to teach that there are three representations. Having my linguistic students, like, fig, you know, remember which is A, which is A, and which is uh, the schwa is probably easy. How do you represent that in spelling then? They'll have to learn letters which are not familiar, which they don't use in their normal Romanized alphabet system. Not in Malay, not in English, and, and you know. So it is too, co to us, it is too complicated, right? So it's not yeah. to keep the identity, it's the complication of... Well, one of the, so if you look at that whole list of things, we had so many things that had to come into play, right? One was uh, ease of use. I don't think the accents are easy to use, if you ask me, but that was then the compromise with identity and how it looks like, right? So in terms of ease of use, at the end of the day, as I said, like the O, we just kept an O. We didn't put accents on everything. So the only accents we used were for the E and for the A. Mm. So on the surface. And the and the, the different C and the Q, Qua, the Qua, Q, A for Qua, and the C and the K representations. Yeah. Yeah. Orthography is more about ideology and politics. Yeah. But that's what I, I we thought she would say, yes. but that's she's not really saying it. But it is, it is. Yeah, because that's what I thought that the answer would be, that it is to preserve the identity. Well, no, it's also ideological issues. You, know, you, you, want it, you don't want it to look like Malay, so yeah. you have to make sure that it's... But if it separate. is the IPA, it will look like a robotic language. Which we don't so want you don't think be. about Portuguese, yeah. you don't think about But you about do Malay. want to, you, you see? see? You just... No, no, but then, then all the languages no, yeah. would look alike if they all did that. If you did IPA, then... Uh, you know, first, I don't think IPA would work. But second, I think IPA is for the linguist and not for the, for the normal person learner. But um, in but the kids, that's what they learn at school. My little neighbor. That's IPA. That's, 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 that's exactly what... Really? They learn he IPA? Can, he cannot, now he has to learn how to read a book. Because the only thing he can read is IPA. That's what they teach what you in this? Camden at school. The little boy. But he cannot read IPA. I'm surprised. I mean, I, they might be doing phonics rather than IPA, I think. It's, it's phonics. phonics or something. Yeah, that's not IPA. That is a reading system. It is yeah, but it's IPA. No, but, I mean, but that is, that is still, still using your Romanized, Romanized uh, letters to say that, you know, CH is a ch and S. So that is, that is not IPA at all. Yeah, you have a question. So. When people are WhatsApping, yeah. are they using the, the, the spelling of Q U A or are they using K? The, you, you have like 10 ways to do it, you know? That's the reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, the book is basically for people who want to learn and for, for, for us to teach uh, people like other side of men. In reality, people are going to spell it any old way. Who's the authority in it? However, um, um, 
there is there is a move now uh, to in the settlement to come up with a committee to work on like standards how far it's gonna go um, I don't really want to be a part of it because <laughs> can you imagine the, the fights that are gonna go on but they but it's good that they're thinking about it you know that they're thinking and I think I think um, that what Kevin is doing in Singapore is actually having this positive effect is that it's pushing people to say do something you know uh, because otherwise we are going to lose it and the Singaporeans are going to grow it from nothing in, into something they will call their own <laughs> this is a Singapore Malaysia tension thing <laughs> sorry you had a question? no, no okay. okay yeah yeah okay. are there any more questions? yes sorry I hope there's no problem with the word for God for God Deus no <laughs> Thank, yes. thank God for that. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, for, for Deus, I, actually before the book, we actually came up with a CD collection of Catholic, because they're mainly Catholic, with Catholic prayers and hymns. Um, and at that point, we, we were experimenting, really experimenting with the spelling, yeah? Um, but yeah, nobody complained about the way, people complain about the hymns, because this is what happens, because when they speak, the t is like a Malay t, it's not like a, it's not, uh, like the English alveola t, it is more of a t, okay, uh, like um, like telah in Malay, right? So it's more de uh, more of a dental stop. Uh, but when they sing, and this happens with some Malay singers as well, uh, to do becomes to do, to do. And people, some people say, oh, you know, why didn't you check the pronunciation in the hymns? And I'm like, when they sing, they all tend to do that. They go t instead of t. I don't know why, but yeah. Yeah. What is the church language? Sorry? What is the church language? What is the church language? English. English. Yeah, yeah. But no but they used to say they used to have mass in Christian in the fifties. Um, I think maybe in the I'm not sure, but I think in the seventies it probably stopped. Sometimes during festivals, some of the prayers, let's say the Our Father Apostles Creed, might be in Christian, and the hymns like during funerals, some of the songs will hymns will be in Christian. So. Having the CD sort of like helped people to remember the prayers that they maybe said as a child in Christian. Yeah. Was there a question? Uh, I was going to ask something pretty similar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't clear why you had arguments with the others. Because I thought there was a writing already mm. in Christian. In fact, there were the slides you showed this morning, there were signposts and so on. Yeah, yeah. So, for the book, why would you okay. have to argue? Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is, this is, no, no, this is what I went in thinking, yeah, easy, it's done, right? Uh -huh. uh, because um, Baxter had, had talked about the, the, had done the grammar of Christian in the, the 70s or 80s, I think, yeah? And um, Marbeck basically followed, used his spelling system. And he said very clearly that he was, he was following a Malay spelling system. But this is where the problem was. People were like, who gave him the right and to decide on the spelling system for us? And in terms of like, you know, like someone asked, you know, and the people WhatsApp or text or wrote letters in those days, what did they write in? They basically wrote in a way that they saw fit. You know, if they were English educated, they would follow a more English spelling, right? So there were actually in reality different ways. If you look at even uh, Facebook posts and so on, you'll find different spellings, but you, you know what is being said, right? So yes, there was a back in Baxter's Dictionary, and then there was a Singapore uh, Dictionary by uh, Zizarte and, oh, I can't remember the other name, okay, but, but two, two ladies. Um, but the community were like, who gave them the right to decide how to spell? So now, again, someone else will say, who did, who, you know, this group of people, even though there were community members there, who gave you guys the right to decide? So it's going to be... Which is why they want to try um, make this committee to decide on some things. Kevin's take in Singapore is like you can spell it in, in ten ways, and that's fine, you know, because it's really a spoken rather than a written language, right? Yeah. Is there an international Creole association? Or something? Yeah. Because uh, I know there's Papua Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is the Association of Pidgin and Creole uh, Languages. Do you, yeah. do, does the community have contact? With uh, that's very academic. Well, you know, I mean, yeah. as a, your job, like as my job, me. Community people, yeah, like that are working, you know, <laughs> revitalizing it. Do they have contact with other Portuguese based people? Yeah, I mean, they they do. They with um with people 
with some people Macau, with some people, it, and it depends on individuals. So it's not like as a community, you know. There was a, there was a Asian uh, Portuguese languages conference convened last year, but again, it's the <coughs> politics of the whole situation. So people were not aligned to the organizer, were not involved, and da da da. I, I, it's, Difficult for me to to explain, but it's politics. It's village politics. It's community politics. And anyone who does documentation revitalization will probably find yourself in that situation. And it's how do you distance yourself when you know as a researcher and as a documenter? Not easy. Not easy. You know, I don't have answers. I go day by day and pray a lot to Deus <laughs> to help me um, from yeah from getting into trouble. And especially because I have. I didn't live in the community, but I have relatives there and good friends, and so that makes it even more difficult. My reputation is at stake as an academic and also as a community mm -hmm. member. It makes it easy and not easy at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think this is, it's an interesting historical case study to see the shift mm. in the way linguistics has operated in the last 40, 50 years. Mm. So Alan Baxter went there as an Australian PhD yeah. student in the 1970s, yeah. and he wrote a grammar and a dictionary. He decided, this is the grammar, this is the dictionary, this is the spelling system. Yeah. Um, and now Steph comes along 40 years later, and it's all community-based, and it's all the disputes yeah. actually. This, this sort of <clears throat> socio-political shift yeah. that's taken place in linguistics yeah. is is very much evident. In yeah. But, but I, 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 must, I must say, I didn't start but, like that, Peter. Um, no, no, and no. the ELDP, being an ELDP grantee, that workshop, it really opened my eyes as to community, 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 and, and, oh, and sort of... <laughs> yeah, you're to blame for me doing this now. Yeah, so I, I have to say, you know, I have to thank um, being given that grant really opened my eyes. Otherwise, I would still be doing, you know, the grab and go kind of linguistics, right? Grab the research and and run off and write my paper, present, yeah. So I, I must must acknowledge that. And the nice thing is that actually Alan is now in Macau. Yeah. And he's he's back into it. Now, yes, and yes, and working, and, and I've been working with him. Yeah. Um, which is the other thing that, you know, and I remember one of the comments I got when I did the grant proposal was like, you must, you know, um, um, cite and, and get in touch with previous people who worked on this. And, and that gave me the courage to actually approach Alan, and he's been very kind enough to, to share his work with me, and we've been writing stuff together as well. So again, thank you to LDP. This is not a, a you know um, an advertisement, but it really helped because coming from Malaysia and working in that kind of um, in a way vacuum that we are, there's not much work on documentation. Which is, but Peter and I now have a Newton grant, and we're working on trying to train. Um, some Malaysian researchers and students into thinking about documentation, proper documentation techniques, so that um, you know then they can go and teach their students and, and fellow researchers. Because I do think that it's important. We have about 130 languages, most of them endangered and dying. Most of them being researched by people outside Malaysia, which is I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but then we have very little access to those to those you know. The, the data and or even the findings, um, they're not archived with us. So I think that it is important to, to share with people um, ethical and proper documentation techniques and also a sustainable way to, one is to share your research so don't do grab and go. And the second one is to, if you're doing revitalization um, efforts or projects, Make it try and make it sustainable because there's no point now after the book I can just say okay done my job you know done my community one point out for me uh, but what's happening did, did I share the way of doing this with my team so that they can now produce their own materials can they do they know how to use the book to teach in the classroom or, or you know in the settlement I think it's more we must also not stop at the producing the materials but what goes after that yeah. We've, yeah. we've run out of time, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, we can talk more. Yeah. Um, Stephanie is, is actually here at SOAS for two weeks as part of the British Academy Newton Senior Newton Fellowship. Um, we have a collaboration that's uh, started last year and going for two years. So she will be around next week as well. Um, and if you'd like to chat to her, or you can come to the University of uh, which will begin in an hour's time, I think. We'll be at the Mulder Arms in an yeah. hour's time. 
So I think probably rather than the usual go down to the Institute of Education, we were thinking we might actually wander over to the Off Marlborough Arms and start early. So um, <laughs> if you would like to have a drink, uh, soft drinks or tea or coffee or alcohol or whatever you want, uh, and chat some more with Stephanie, then we can do that um, uh, over at the Marlborough Arms. So join me in thanking Stephanie. For Thank you so much.